the Medicine Bowl Mountains, you know, stretch from the uh, Elk Mountain, clear down into Colorado, clear down into Cameron Pass. And during the uh, 19th century, why, there was a lot of mining activity went on there for about 40 years. You just take a casual drive through the Snowy Range area, you're going to see old mining artifacts, both sides of the road, all through the range. If you get off the beaten track, you'll see the caved uh, diggings of some of the old mines. You occasionally see a rock tunnel dug into solid rock that is, a, you know, it's still in fairly good condition. Also, you're going to see old mining machinery laying here and there. A lot of this was collected during the, the two world wars, the uh, scrap collections and so forth. A lot of this disappeared during those scrap collections. But throughout the mountains, you're going to find uh, sometimes nothing more than a, uh, what they call a discovery shaft, uh, 10 foot by 10 foot uh, square. Each one of these old camps that developed very far had a stamp mill. Very little is left of these stamp mills. Almost all the major camps had one. All the metal is gone, but you'll still find some of the structure in some of these places. And of course, close to each one of these mining camp areas is a log cabin, or almost always log dwelling of some kind, where the miners lived and worked these mines. This story is not only about the mines, it's about the miners and the people who worked in these areas. Not, it's not a geological uh, story or anything. It's about the people who spent time in these areas. The first of these old camps was Last Chance. Uh, the first mention of any new gold discovery was done in the spring of 1868. This is just about the time the Union Pacific Railroad made it to the Laramie Plains. The uh, Frontier Index was the first newspaper in this part of the country and one of their very first issues they announced that gold had been found in the hills west of, uh, around Laramie City, and it was Dakota Territory at that time. Wyoming didn't become a territory until uh, July 10th, I believe it was, 1868. So as far as these people were concerned, this was still in Dakota. Uh, hundreds preparing to dive in the North Park and on the big and little Laramies. They didn't have their <coughs> locations exact, but uh, they had a general idea where this uh, gold was going on. Uh, now the first claim was made right where Rob Roy Reservoir is on the Douglas Creek. And they called this creek, uh, first when they first found this, they called it the Antonia River. They didn't know, uh, Douglas Creek it was already named apparently at that time, but they didn't know where they were for sure. They saw a major stream flowing southward. They found Antonia, 1830 carved on a tree. They called this Antonia. Very short time later, they picked up the name Last Chance and also Park Gulch still on the, on the Douglas Creek. The very first claim that was recorded, not necessarily made, the very first claim that was recorded was the Morning Star, and it was made by John B. Wands, December 11, 1868 is when it was filed, a few days before Albany County was, even became a county, but it was recorded and filed in the Albany County Courthouse about five days before Albany County was founded. Very early in the program, a man called Stephen W. Downey, Civil War veteran, he had become a colonel, was wounded in battle, moved west, and was one of the very early Wyoming pioneers. The Downey name you might associate with some of the names in Laramie, Downey Hall and so forth, were some of his descendants, not from Stephen W. Downey himself. Uh, very uh, well-known man at the time. He, he could have won any election he ran in, uh, very well liked, very well known at the time. Uh, this initial mining that was done on Douglas Creek was all placer mining. Uh, they didn't get into load mining until some time later. They were using gold pans, long toms, and sluice boxes to do their initial mining. The first year or so they took out about $8,000 of gold out of uh, Douglas Creek, the first two years. Uh, gold at that time was selling for about $20 an ounce. So we're talking 400 ounces of gold. So that wasn't a bad cleanup for those people. And there was not a great deal of them. There was probably less than 100 of them doing this mining at first. Mining went along pretty well until in 1870, about two years after this started, there was a um, massacre in North Park. By a massacre, it wasn't 100 people or 20 people or anything like that. It was four people were killed and then four a day or so later. This was called the Shipman Cabin Massacre. Um, 
and it scared off the miners for some time. For a by while. Indians? By Indians, by the Utes. The Utes had moved up, and generally it was um, uh, credited to Chief Collaro and um, possibly Captain Jack, who was also a uh, Ute chief. Scared them out of the high mountains and away from North Park for some time. Uh, about a year or two later, um, some of the same miners were prospecting along the Big and Little Laramie, and they uh, were prospecting on the Centennial Ridge, and they made a discovery that uh, became worldwide, or at least nationwide, uh, nationwide known in uh, 1874. Now, because this is named Centennial, a lot of people think it was made in 1876, but the impending Centennial celebration, they apparently went ahead and named it the Centennial. The Centennial Mine, um, here again we see Stephen W. Downing and some of the other people involved in this uh, mining activity. Found a very good outcropping of uh, quartz gold. Uh, it was a load mine, not a placer mine. You still see the remains of the mine as you drive westward into Centennial. If you look up on the hill on the left, you see the tailings right in the center of the uh, drawing there. And that's where the original Centennial Mine was. They went down with three shaft, well, one shaft first. They went down about 60 feet, ended up against a solid granite wall with no vein in sight at that time. At that time, they'd gone down and mined about $80,000 worth of gold as they went down, and then the, the vein faulted. $80,000 that day at $20 an ounce, that's quite a bit of gold. Um, anyway, the vein faulted against the solid rock wall, and so they pulled out of that one, started another shaft right beside it at a slightly different angle, hoping to pick up the vein. They didn't find anything in that one, so they started a third one. And in the meantime, they were dumping the debris down one of the mine shafts. Uh, these were all very close together, and they accidentally broke into one of the other mine shafts. The uh, air was bad, they were getting water in the shaft, and they abandoned the mine at that time. But during the course of this, uh, the mine you see up in the blue part of the sky there, they built a tramway down to the nearest level piece of ground where they constructed a stamp mill, 425 feet in length, about 125 feet vertically. And they started transporting this stuff, and they built this old stamp mill on the side of the hill. It's the first level piece of ground there. Here they put in a 10-stamp mill, a 10-stamp battery. And at first they drove this by water. Now, if you go up there to this day, you, you won't find a lot of water running by there. There's a little gully there with a, just a tiny stream in it. But there's every evidence that at that time, water ran more freely. There was more water throughout the snowy range. The snow was deeper, the streams were deeper, the snowpack was more, the rains were heavier. But even at that, as winter approached, they didn't have enough power left to run this, uh, as things froze up and dried up, they didn't have enough power to run this stamp mill. So, they actually abandoned for that winter, and the next summer they put in a steam engine to run these, and they, uh, they just cut the uh, existing wood in the area and powered their steam power plant. Now, whether this exact steam engine is the one that operated or not, I can't tell you, but this is a 19th century steam engine that's still laying beside the old mill. Close to the mill, a little town sprung up. Now, this isn't where Centennial is now. This is uh, half, three quarters of a mile away. And there are still numerous cabins in the area that these people built and lived in there. There was a hotel, there was a boarding house, and numerous living cabins. This went on for about two or three years. And uh, at, during that time, they established a stage service to Laramie, uh, Laramie being the closest supply point. Thomas Bird. Um, who was well known, and he was a rancher in the valley actually. He took up gold mining temporarily. Then he saw where the real money was in the stage uh, line. Uh, leaves Laramie Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, returning in all the days. Took him only about six hours to run a stage out from Laramie. That's a pretty good time, uh, considering you know, they didn't have a highway or anything out there at that time. One of the uh, people in Laramie took a very definite interest in all this mining, James H. Hayford, who happened to be the editor of the Laramie Sentinel. He was also postmaster, he's a justice piece, several other things. But his newspaper was very instrumental in promoting gold mines for the next 20 years. Stephen W. Downey stayed in there, and between he and Hayford, they promoted these mines almost 
single-handedly between the two of them. Left on Centennial, uh, up on Centennial Ridge, there's still some of these old artifacts left. Now, most of this is of a slightly later era. Uh, there's very little left of the 1874 mining, but there are there is some machinery uh, for years, and uh, to this day, people are still trying to find that folded vein in the Centennial Mine because it was a very, very rich vein, and there is some mining and some buildings and so forth on the ridge of Centennial. That's Jake. Uh, in later years, uh, some of the mines changed names several times. The Utopia was one of them. Uh, this was just below the main Centennial Mine. They, uh, they were finding some low quality ore on Centennial Ridge, and everybody was hoping for a railroad. Well, the railroad finally made it in, but not till 1906, and it stopped in Centennial. It didn't continue on like it does now. But uh, that didn't help the mining activity either. Uh, they tried shipping some low-grade ores, and uh, that didn't pay off either. About the, even before the Centennial era, high up on the Snowy Range here, area, uh, they went into an area they called La Plata. La Plata means Spanish for silver. And in this area, they uh, staked out quite a few uh, claims, uh, primarily for silver. This limestone in this area to this day has silver deposits in it. Uh, they had a lot of difficulty digging in the solid rock, had a lot of difficulty with water. This is taken from up on Brown's, uh, Brown's Peak. Uh, this is basically the area that covered the La Plata mining area. And if you notice those little squares in there, this is a 1904 map, I believe, 1906, something like that. There were still a lot of little cabins left scattered around that area. You can still find uh, the remains of some of those in this area. When these people came into the area, this, uh, none of these hills, mountains were named. So, as most of some of you may recognize, that's Sugarloaf there. They didn't know, uh, recognize that as Sugarloaf, they call that Big Pyramid. If you look off to the right, there's another little mountain. They call that Little Pyramid. They call it Medicine Gold Peak, Big Haystack. <laughs> Some of the remains are still in the area. This is the Red Mask, um, which came along in the, in the 1900s, uh, about 1920 or so. The Red Mask has deteriorated this uh, to, to what you see here now over the years, and it isn't going to be too many more years if this is probably going to disappear completely. Uh, this is uh, near the Red Mask. It's one of the cabins that was used by the miners. Uh, one of the things the miners uh, left on the area is, uh, was their names. And also, there's still a little bit of equipment left there. This, the lake on the left is Lewis Lake. The lake on the right is a small lake. It's not marked on the uh, USGS maps. It's called Class Lake. Near Class Lake, you see some mining ruins just right between the two lakes there. <laughs> This is the remains of the Billy Class stamp mill. Billy Class was a well-known miner for many, many years in that area. You still see part of the steam engine. You see, still see part of the bull wheel there in the background. Also the base for the stamp mill. Now these are probably the only stamps left within the Snowy Range area, the only ones I've found. A stamp is a heavy metal ram that was picked up and dropped and crushed the ore. And they weigh about 350, 400 pounds minimum a piece, so people aren't going to pick them up and drag them off easily unless they're beside a road someplace. And these have to be sitting over where you can't get a vehicle to them. So they, they remain there. Hopefully they'll be protected uh, against people hauling them off. Now, Billy Class built this concrete base and so forth a little bit later. In fact, the date is still carved on the base of where he had the steam engine mounted, uh, 1911. But Billy Class was in this area earlier. One of the other things that are left on the land here is Lewis Lake. William H. Lewis was a miner. He worked with Billy Class for a while. Better known down in the Keystone area where there was a Lewis Creek. Also, also he was a foreman of one of the uh, later mining mills. Another name left is Towner Lake. It's named uh, Ben Towner was a miner who spent time in almost all of the Medicine Bowl mining camps. He, uh, came to the area about 1880 and died in 1915, still vowing that it would take his last dime. He was going to strike it rich. It took his last dime, but he never did strike it rich. He's buried in Laramie. Brown's Peak, another one of the names left there. Melville C. Brown, who later on became a well-known attorney, a judge, and was on the uh, state constitutional convention, was actually a miner when he first came out in this part of the country and worked as a miner. 
he didn't stay in town and have people make claims for him. He was actually out doing some of the claims himself. <coughs> Excuse me. Brown thought there was enough silver out there, and he actually stated there's enough silver out there to build railroads with. So he was pretty enthused with his, uh, his area. Another person that came along a little later, named a guy by the name of John Morris, who built a cabin down in South French Creek Valley. This is all that's left of John Morris's uh, cabin. But John Morris is still buried beside his cabin where he died after a trip to Centennial and back on foot, 16 miles. He brought his pack back to the cabin, set it down, and died. They didn't find him for several weeks. One of his friends finally found him, and they were in such poor condition they buried him beside his cabin. The next mining area was located behind Gel Mountain. Maybe uh, one of the most recognized Gel Mountain. Uh, started out as a camp called J.J. McGreevy's. James J. McGreevy had a tie camp there, one of the very earliest tie camps in the area. He was one of the first ones to recognize there was placer gold in the streams there, so they started a placer mine in the area. And by 1880, uh, this had evolved into a mining camp, full blown mining camp, and basically for load mining at that time. They laid out a, uh, a town with uh, a couple hundred lots. They had a hotel, or they had several hotels, saloons, so forth. Go with it. Uh, you can still see the remains of that old town along the uh, Big Laramie River just south of Woods Landing. It's called Old Jelm as opposed to New Jelm, which, which is a, a cabin area. Uh, during this time, why, uh, Cummins City was pretty well known, and it was a uh, main stopover point on stagecoach and freight travel going into North Park that had a lot of gold mining activity at the same time. John Cummins was uh, one of the guys who promoted this whole thing. He, uh, he went to court several times during his lifetime, and the, uh, a lot of the fraud went on in the area is blamed on John Cummins. Some of it rightfully so, a lot of it not so. Uh, Woods, or actually his name is Woods, Samuel S. Wood, who incidentally was buried here in Saratoga. Uh, Woods Landing is named after this gentleman, and he had a um, lot of mining claims in the area. Also, he established Woods Landing as a, uh, uh, a tie camp and also a stopover point for the uh, North Park Stagecoach. Several companies were um, established at this time. The Wyoming Consolidated Gold and Silver Mining Company, the Gel Mountain Gold and Silver Mining Company. Uh, notice that these are incorporated for around a million dollars a piece. A million dollars in that day and age, pretty hard to estimate now what that would be worth, but uh, these were figures to promote the mine. These weren't actual figures. Uh, around the turn of the century, uh, there was a little bit more left of Cummins City. Uh, note the amount of water around there at that time. Like I say, I think the entire country was wetter, the streams ran fuller and so forth during that uh, during those early days. This was the Frank Smith Ranch. Frank Smith um, was later mixed up in some of the copper mining frauds. When I, the old schoolhouse in Cummins City is still there, the old Jelm. Uh, it was actually built at Jelm rather than Cummins City. Cummins City and Jelm are the same place, but the, uh, the schoolhouse Instead, now there's a cemetery on the hill in the back of the schoolhouse there. Uh, came along about 1903. And this is one of the old buildings left. Probably part of Jelm rather than Old Cummins City. The uh, predominant mine at the time is a Silver Mountain uh, mining claim. First called the Gold Hill Mining Claim. Had nothing to do with the Gold Hill we have on this side. That was just the name of it. This was the one that John Cummins promoted. He bought it at $500, sold it to his partners for $5,000. Uh, John Cummins was entrepreneur, to say the least, a crook, maybe uh, <laughs> at, the, uh, at the most. But he did a lot of this, and he was actually taken to court by his partners, who were mostly Colorado people, but they never showed up for court, so uh, John Cummins basically won the uh, lawsuit. Left around Cummins City, especially up in the, this is the Sunrise Pass area, the Sunrise Mine, where again one of the miners were killed. They, uh, he was not a miner really, he was a, a partner in the mines. They lowered him down a 160 foot shaft here. He looked at the uh, vein at the bottom, they brought him back up, and as they were bringing him back up in the ore bucket, 
Well, he fell out of the ore bucket, fell down a hundred and some feet, struck the other ore bucket on the way down, and died a few minutes later. Um, this is the Sunrise Mine in the foreground here. This is located close to Ring Mountain. If you notice the, the uh, stone ring on the side of the mountain, that's a natural stone ring, and it's been known as Ring Mountain since the 1870s. Uh, at the time, uh, Cummins City did not have their own newspaper, but they did publish in the Laramie Sentinel under the um, column uh, Cummins City Clatter. And uh, almost, uh, well, about weekly, they would have a full column there telling the details of what was going on in the camp. They issued a lot of stock certificates. Um, this one is the uh, Gel Mountain Gold Silver Mining Milling Company. This one happens to be, be made out to a guy by the name of Louis Miller, Louis Miller, who uh, went on to become uh, sheriff he was the first fish commissioner in Wyoming and uh, so forth, but he, uh, he was one of the mining uh, promoters also. Uh, HBS Grossbeck, Herman Grossbeck was uh, a partner of Miller's. Uh, his first job, he came west to find a job as an attorney in a mining camp. And his first job, rather than being an attorney, they didn't have any use for him as an attorney, was uh, a bartender for Sam Woods. He said the bar consisted of a plank across two barrels, and he earned a dollar and fifty cents a day uh, doing that. He later became Wyoming's first Supreme Court Justice. Frank Smith came along about the same time. He knew uh, John, uh, John Cummins. Frank Smith was uh, one of the promoters of the turn of the century mining, uh, gold, uh, copper mining claims. And Frank Smith probably came a lot closer to being a crook than uh, John Cummins ever was. Uh, during, the, uh, during this time, it was basically a copper mining area. And uh, Jelm City <coughs> at that time was laid out <coughs> on paper only as a place with uh, over a thousand lots. For example, it was advertised in the Minneapolis-St. Uh, Paul paper as a town of 1,000. It was going to be 10,000 within the year and uh, would be one of the big mining towns in the West. As it turned out, at that time, <coughs> Jelm City had 17 people. <laughs> the next year, the, the census, 1900, said they had 21 people. The following year, they fell to 12 people when they had their uh, election. So you can see they, they exaggerated just a little bit. <laughs> Oops, we've got to change slides here. Teller City. Now, this is not in Wyoming, but it is still in the Medicine Bowl Mountains. It's the, the extreme south end of the Medicine Bowl Mountains. This is a uh, sign that was, uh, I assume, erected by the Forest Service. Uh, tells a short story about it, which some of it is not true. Um, <laughs> When the city was abandoned so quickly, the dirty dishes left on the table so Actually, it was not. It took several years for the uh, city to be abandoned. But uh, anyway, in 1880, <laughs> yeah, the Teller Town site was laid out, and this is down, you know, close between Rand and Gould. And you can still drive right into this area with just an automobile. Very interesting area. Close by was another place they called Park City. You know, none of these mines were camps or anything. They're all cities. Although Teller City probably was the largest mining camp in the entire Medicine Bowl region, if you go all the way down. Tyner City, located up the canyon from Teller City, probably had three cabins and probably about 20 people, as far as I can tell. Beautiful area. If you ever go down there and visit that area, because Jack Creek runs through there. Very, very pretty area. Uh, one of the nice things about Teller City <coughs> is you can date these cabins right down almost to the, you know, at least to the year. And it gives you an idea of how cabins and so forth survive uh, through that many winters. Now this is a high snowfall area, but a lot of these cabins are still standing. These were built in 1880. Now you'll find some places that where the cabins don't dry out in the summertime, you'll find they've rotted away to nothing. But these cabins, you can almost uh, date them you know, right down to the year. Notice that uh, not very many windows and hardly any masonry chimneys. At the time, it was said that all the, stove, all the cabins in camp had a metal stove, which was unusual for a mining camp, but they did go to the uh, trouble of actually freighting in a bunch of metal stoves, and they used uh, what they call a Sibley stove or, uh, or a cast iron stove. Further up Jack Creek, uh, about a thousand feet higher, you find the cabins have deteriorated even more. Uh, you, we can identify these by some of the old mining plats as one of these is the boarding house. This was the blacksmith shop. The blacksmith shop has had some 
somebody probably using it for a, a hunting camp or something, had a roof rework on it. But these can be dated pretty well right down to the year. Notice the large gaps in the logs. Uh, you'll, you can uh, find some of these that still have the strips, the small poles put in and plastered over. So apparently this was their construction technique for that particular area. A little differently than you'll find in some of the other ones where there was more tie, <coughs> tie hacks and lumbermen involved with it. The predominant mine, the Teller area, was the end of mile. And it was located up Jack Creek. And if you, you can't see it, but on that map are the details that tell you exactly where the blacksmith shop were, where Smith's cabin was, and so forth. And these are some of those that you can identify. Uh, still a few open shafts. This one's almost full of water, but a little scary anyway to walk up to. Uh, you, you know, with water in it, you aren't going to fall a great distance, but uh, there's, uh, there's still open shafts in the area. But the end of mile mine itself was reworked, was worked in later years, and you can still walk into that if you're brave enough. But you can see that the land around there is still uh, still caving in on it. And uh, this is one of the areas in Colorado that has, is leaching out chemicals and so forth out of the mine. They're natural, but it's still leaching uh, and uh, polluting the stream. Uh, the reason I believe that was worked later is because this machinery was not brought in during the 1880s. This machinery dates a little bit later, probably around the turn of the century. There again, beautiful area. It's well worth the trip up in there. The next area, back up on the Wyoming side, below the old Last Chance area, a place called Douglas City. Um, if you look at the very top of the map, you see the fence and the downy, the Roberts cabin, those, and the Last Chance, that was the old mining. That's where Rob Roy Reservoir is now. Douglas City was an early name for Keystone. And of course, Keystone is still there, and uh, we recognize it. Uh, this is about a turn of the century map of Keystone, showing some of the cabins and some of the other areas in there. Douglas Creek, uh, it, even early in the game, uh, looked like it was going to be a real paying mining area because it had not only load mining, but also had placer mining. And here again, they established um, a stagecoach. And um, this was, I uh, believe, by Jacob Fine. And a week later, or just a couple weeks later, the, uh, from a weekly stage, they advanced to a tri-weekly stage, leaving Laramie uh, at 7 a.m. in the morning and arriving, if it was on time, at Douglas City 12 hours later, which means they really had to push that thing. I had to get four horse changes uh, in the course of the trip out there. Um, not only were they doing load mining, but they had discovered hydraulic mining. In other words, they were piping or ditching water down to the Douglas Creek and the areas around there and doing some rather extensive uh, bedrock placer mining where they brought water in and washed away huge quantities of dirt and ran it through their sluices and uh, were uh, getting some good placer gold. To this day, you can still get good placer gold in there. But the load mining was the primary thing, and it, this was the largest mill built in the Medicine Bowl Mountains. The, this particular building was built in 1889 and processed gold at the rate of about $100, $125, $150 a day. At the time, they were employing 27 employees underground, uh, three foremen above ground. Those underground were getting about $3 a day. Those above ground were getting about $4 a day. If you worked that out, well, they were paying out about $200 in wages every day and taking in about $150 in gold every day. This went on for several years before they discovered they were making money. And besides that, they had to put up the plant. <laughs> uh, at the time, that particular stamp mill was run by a water wheel because Douglas Creek offered a tremendous amount of water power. This was before Rob Roy Reservoir, and Douglas Creek would just roar in the springtime. But as fall would come on, why uh, they would run low on water. So they actually ditched water. You can still see those ditches. If you go in below Rob Roy Reservoir, you'll see what look like pathways leading down along the side of those ridges. Those are filled in ditches. And those are the old uh, ditches that went down to Keystone. Uh, as time went by, they found that water and steam power, as they did at Centennial, was the answer. So they put in a steam-powered plant also to augment their water power. And they didn't want to go far from their timber, so you can see they cut the area around, right around the mill pretty, uh, pretty extensively and used that timber 
for their uh, milk. Even then, they, lost, they ran short in the wintertime. They would advertise in the Laramie paper for uh, choppers to come out and chop wood for them. The, uh, on the ridge above the Keystone Mine, the old air shafts can be seen. These are 180 feet deep. They are filled in now. And uh, there's three or four of them along the top line. Look at the old mining plats. You can actually decide just exactly where they went to. Well, down in Douglas Creek itself, they advance beyond the uh, placer mining, the basic panning and, and sluice box, to a little more modern outfit. This guy had a steam engine and a long tom uh, placer thing. Here they were doing some hydraulic mining, doing some tremendous amount of washing of dirt away. One of the amazing things to me is that nature has recovered this area, and um, they were piping water down to this, but um, being since it's in a high flow water area, this area is, all, is filled back in again now. But that's that's what hydraulic mining did at the time. They would they would actually bring a um, hydraulic nozzle down, point it against those hillsides, and just wash down tons and tons of dirt earth and run it through one of their uh, sluice boxes. Keystone had a post office. First it was Douglas City. Actually, it was first it was just Last Chance. Then they moved it down the stream a little ways, called it Douglas City. Douglas City, incidentally, was spelled with two S's at the time. Uh, and then became the Keystone Post Office. This, this building still stands in uh, Keystone. And the owner of it came up and talked to me the last time I gave a talk over in Laramie. His name was Gunnarsson. Um, Keystone at the turn of the century had pretty well dwindled down to just tie hacks and uh, uh, lumber camp. <coughs> Close by was another place called the Florence Mine. They too had a stamp mill and uh, processed what they thought was going to be uh, a bonanza in gold. This building is on Keystone property. This is the old Florence property. Uh, recently they've gone in, the DEQ of Wyoming's gone in and closed off the shaft at the, uh, at the Florence. Uh, all that's left of the Florence now is this milled lumber, and it, this was lying directly over the shaft. The, um, one of the tunnels is just view, uh, in view on the right-hand side of the picture there. But they had a vertical shaft, they had several horizontal shafts in the area. Uh, not too far from there, up the creek from there, is another old cabin. This one happened to be belong to a guy named John Walbright. Similar to some of the other people, uh, he lived there by himself and died in his cabin. 1886, and he's buried just across the road from his cabin. This used to be a crib of logs. When I was a younger fellow, I'd seen this, and it was, uh, it was marked in a crib of logs. Now it's uh, deteriorated to the point where uh, only by excavating would you prove that there was a grave there. One of the other interesting graves in the area is one walk a guy by the name of Burl Pete, Placer Pete, Dirty Pete. He went by a lot of different names. Uh, most people uh, that thought they knew his name called him Pete Kennesaw. Pete Kennesaw was coming over the mountain one day from uh, Sheep Mountain to Douglas Creek. He sat down beside a tree and died, apparently, of a heart attack. Well, the Burroughs, they knew where to go, so they, they showed up in Keystone. Pete never did, so they organized a search party, and they went out and they found Pete sitting beside the tree, dead. His dog was still with him. But anyway, they buried Pete beside the road there, or beside the old trail in Muddy Park. And as they buried Pete, they come to find out his name wasn't even Pete. <laughs> his name was Egbert Singleton. Well, a name like Egbert, maybe Pete was a little better. Than that. <laughs> Turned out this guy was a Civil War hero and come west and spent his uh, lifetime over these mountains. Uh, about 1889, Gold Hill um, became a prominent gold mining camp. And uh, it was located up, uh, most of you probably know where it is, in the uh, Twin Lake, Phantom Lake area. At the turn of the century, <coughs> when this map was made, there were still a lot of cabins and so forth. The, all those little black squares in there are cabins as they exist today. You can still find the ruins of those cabins. You can't find the cabins themselves. In the area are a lot of mining artifacts. For example, this old boiler, this rock crusher. <coughs> This is a huge piece of metal. It's no wonder nobody ever moved it. I don't know what that thing would possibly weigh. That arm coming in there where it's broken, it must be at least eight inches, uh, six, eight inches square, something like that. that. That little crusher, I don't know what it would weigh. It's a very, very heavy piece of metal. And one of the little draws there, I found this little piece of machinery sticking out of the mud, the debris there. And I didn't know what a Bartlett concentrator was, so I looked it up. Turns out it's a pretty good sized chunk of machinery. It's barely buried underneath that thing. So Bartlett concentrator was actually built 
by the Colorado Iron Works in Colorado. Uh, about the time uh, there was a man called M.D. Houghton who uh, did several drawings of Saratoga and so forth, Gold Hill. His drawings are accurate to the placement of uh, buildings and so forth. He exaggerated hills and things like that, but uh, as far as the placement of things, why, uh, apparently quite accurate. The larger building you see there is the Acme Hotel. This is the main street of Gold Hill. Uh, if you ever, anybody ever told you it was a big city or anything like that, why this is uh, kind of belies the thought that uh, it was just a, another mining camp, although they, they did have quite a few saloons and uh, cabins there. Uh, the Acme Hotel was set up at the camp by a guy by the name of A.W. Ainsworth, and, and who's buried here, and also uh, several of his relatives. Uh, maybe there are still some Ainsworths here in Saratoga, I'm not sure. The Acme Hotel was built um, not in what they called Gold Hill at the time. Now, the entire area is called Gold Hill now. <clears throat> but they, they called this Greenville, and it was just a portion of Gold Hill. And you can still see the remains of the old uh, hotel uh, just a short distance off the road going into uh, Rasta Lake. Notice, compared to, these were built 10 years after the teller mines, the teller cabins. Notice that this has deteriorated almost completely as opposed to the teller cabins are still standing upright. Part of that is due to the high snowfall in this area and that this stays wet almost year round. And another thing is this had a lot of milled lumber in it as opposed to just a straight log structure. Straight, uh, a pure log structure will last longer than a milled uh, structure. Uh, one of the uh, mines that uh, drew a lot of people at first was the Little Giant Mine. Uh, they found a gold seam and they followed it down into the hillside and it was kind of a catalyst drawing more and more people into this area. Another one was the Acme Mine. Very early the Acme Mine was apparently taking out good ore. If you notice the tarp in the foreground there, it must have some select ore in it. The strange thing about Gold Hill is very little record of any gold coming out of there. Uh, there, were a little bit of, there was a little bit of gold. Stephen W. Downey again, promoting the stamp mill and Gold Hill. At this time, he was a uh, member of the first university uh, board of directors. Those people around him were all the University of Wyoming uh, board of directors. Stephen W. Downey was very well known, very well liked at the time, did a lot of those things. Later on, about the turn of the century, the Acme Mine built a uh, mill and a tramway and so forth going down. Uh, and you notice a little lake in the background. There you, you, you still walk up to this area. There's more timber, of course, there now and it looks like this from the other side. There again, the uh, stage was a uh, necessity and uh, they established a stage line not only from Rollins but also Fort Steele and they even tried from Old Carbon uh, the uh, Rollins and the Saratoga stages which both ran through Saratoga became the uh, only stage lines that actually uh, served the camp uh, the Saratoga stage would run year-round. Uh, in the uh, springtime, they would go as far as where about, about where 10 Mile is now, and they would convert to a sled. And then they would try to make the run into the gold camp and back before the snow melted in the spring, you know, during the day, before the snow got soft. So consequently, uh, uh, if you came from Rollins, you'd come to Saratoga the first day, stay overnight, get in the stage, go to 10 Mile, or headquarters as they called it at the time, or one of the hotels out there, spend the night and then get up very early in the morning and trying to make it into Gold Hill before the snow got soft, which is about 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, in 1891, they, had, they were trying to promote the mines, and this Gold Hill excursion was advertised in the Denver newspapers. Round trip ticket, $22, that included rail fare to Rollins, meals, stage fare to Saratoga and on to the mines, and overnight accommodations at Gold Hill and back again for $22. I was never able to find out how many people actually made the excursion. Apparently a few people did. Uh, the Gold Era left, of course, scars upon the land, but they also left their name. Stamp Mill Lake, Araster Lake, Araster Creek, some of these things. Now these names have actually changed back and forth a couple times over the years. Uh, the uh, Stamp Mill Lake, for example, was known as Mineral Lake at one time. Uh, 
Magnolia Lake was known as Stamp Mill Lake, Raster Lake was known as something else. So they actually have traded names back and forth. It makes it difficult to uh, do research on the area. The uh, Gold Hill area era kind of skidded to a halt about 1892-93. About 1893, another gold camp was established over the Cooper Hill area called Morgan. Actually, uh, this was in an area called the Herman Mining District. The Herman Mining District was actually over on the Medicine Bow River, on, between Rock Creek and the Medicine Bow River. And so Cooper Hill became part of the Herman Mining District, although the Herman Mining District never progressed much beyond about a half a dozen mines. In this valley, between Cooper Hill and the main range, and on that ridge, which is Cooper Hill, why George Morgan, a new, new guy in the mining scene, uh, found what they thought was going to be a great gold discovery. Uh, incidentally, George Morgan had kind of taken the place of uh, Stephen W. Downey about this time. Stephen W. Downey ran out of steam, health, and, and money all about the same time. George Morgan, probably go down in history as the first person to introduce Hereford Cattle to this part of the country, not as a gold miner. Of course, Morgan is named after him, but uh, in the book Centennial by James Mishner, he is fictionalized as the first person to bring Hereford Cattle into this country, but he is, he is known as the uh, uh, father of the Hereford breed in this part of the country. Uh, all this mining took place along the uh, Cooper Hill Ridge. Cooper Hill was uh, Cooper Mountain called Bald Mountain at the time. Uh, there were several Bald Mountains in the uh, area, including Kennedy Peak was known as Old Bald Ear, Bald Mountain. Uh, there was another one by Centennial, so rather than call this Bald Mountain, they came up with the name Cooper Hill. Uh, the first mine that they found on Cooper Hill is called the Emma G. This is what remained of it. Uh, named after one of the daughters of one of the miners. At the opposite end of the hill was the North Star Mine. Still has an open shaft. Overlooks the wood edge area. Uh, also in the canyons around there, there are some horizontal shafts into solid rock that are still pretty solid. Uh, <coughs> if you wanted to venture into one, I guess you could. I, I don't do that kind of thing. A uh, little town grew up in the valley called Morgan, called Morganville first, and they actually petitioned the U.S. Post Office for a post office by the name of Morganville. They wanted George Morgan as the postmaster. Well, it took a couple of years for the post office to act, and when they did, they decided to call it Morgan, not Morganville, because there was already a Morganville, I believe, in Pennsylvania, so they, they decided to call this Morgan. And by that time, George Morgan had moved on, and another guy became the postmaster. Uh, this is the way Morgan looks today. The uh, two-story building is still there, which was a hotel at one time. It was a boarding house at one time. It's been various things. Let me back up one. You see the uh, old blacksmith shop is still there, the two-story building. They've changed a little bit, but it's still the same buildings. You look at the hillside in the background, and you actually see that we've actually gained a little timber back there in that area. Uh, these gentlemen, George Fox, are able to identify some of these people uh, by their other pictures, by a lady in uh, Medicine Bowl, Wyoming, who actually recognized some of these people. But, uh, George Fox was a well-known businessman, kind of down on his luck at that time, and Ben Towner is the uh, one standing closest to it. I never was able to identify the guy on the hill. This was called the Upper uh, Rip Van Winkle Mine, and this picture was taken about the turn of the century. And today it looks like this. The mine has deteriorated, the rocks have even fallen down, but look at the tree in the background. Let me back up one. The tree in the background. <laughs> That's what happens with timber line. <laughs> tree stays there and everything else falls apart around them. Huh. Uh, they weren't able to go very deep on those ridges because they were just limited in, uh, on how deep they could dig in that rock. So they went down about 100 feet, still falling a vein, weren't able to go any deeper. So they went down the mountain and start, started a horizontal shaft into the side of the mountain to try and intercept that uh, uh, lead. And this particular shaft went into the side of the hill about 600 feet. Sometimes with a pretty good crew of people, and sometimes by one individual, this uh, Ben Towner would dig on that by himself. This is what remains of the lower Rip Van Winkle to this day. The uh, cabin is still under the shack. The, the uh, shaft is caved in completely. And good old Jake standing guard. Uh, this is uh, in the same area. Uh, again, the background, it's kind of interesting to look at the, uh, now I don't have the second picture of that, but. 
Uh, here again, we were able to identify most of those people. That mining cart was still there, that uh, ore cart was still there until just quite recently. Uh, interestingly enough, it was running on wooden rails. The wooden rails have lasted all these years, 100 years, while well, their metal rails have either rusted away or been carted away, one or the other. But those wooden rails are still laying there. Uh, there were several, as in all the camps, a lot of uh, individuals that I wasn't able to identify that lived in the old mining towns. These people stuck around for about four or five years as they built a, a stamp mill and so forth. As soon as the stamp mill was built and operated, it became apparent that the ore wasn't as rich as they thought it was going to be, and the mining camp was abandoned. And that's what happened to a lot of these mining camps. Their, their best hope was for a stamp mill, but when they got the stamp mill, they found out the ore wasn't as good as they thought, and the, the mining camp would fail. Probably the last of the last century miners was this gentleman here, and uh, he lived in Laramie until uh, I believe 1948. And I was never able to talk to him individually or anything, but he left a lot of uh, a lot of stories on the, about the old mines. His name's Al Alford, buried in Laramie. One of the things that, uh, although they never took very many riches out of any of the medicine gold mines, one of the things that happened is it did promote business and industry in Laramie and, of course, Saratoga. Uh, there was many of the stores catered to the miner, and that was what some of their prime uh, customers were the miners. W.H. Holiday Company, uh, there was just numerous uh, companies that were doing that kind of thing at that time. And that's basically what happened in the uh, Medicine Bowl mining area. And this is the last of the good cabins. This is my place here, right there, why uh, stop in and say hello.